Papias Greek Papias was a Greek apostolic father, bishop of Hierapolis, modern Pamukkale, Turkey, and author who lived c. 60 to 163 AD. It was Papias who wrote the exposition of the sayings of the Lord, Greek Logian Kyriakon exegesis in five books. This work, which is lost apart from brief excerpts in the works of Irenaeus of Lyons c. 180 and Eusebius of Caesarea c. 320, is an important early source on Christian oral tradition and especially on the origins of the canonical Gospels. Life Topic. Very little is known of Papias apart from what can be inferred from his own writings. He is described as, "...an ancient man who was a hearer of John and a companion of Polycarp." By Polycarp's disciple Irenaeus c. 180, Eusebius adds that Papias was bishop of Hierapolis around the time of Ignatius of Antioch. In this office Papias was presumably succeeded by Abertius of Hierapolis. The name Papias was very common in the region, suggesting that he was probably a native of the area. Date The work of Papias is dated by most modern scholars to about 95–120. Later dates were once argued from two references that now appear to be mistaken. One dating Papias' death to around the death of Polycarp in 164 is actually a mistake for Papylus. Another unreliable source in which Papias is said to refer to the reign of Hadrian 117-138 seems to have resulted from confusion between Papias and Quadratus. Eusebius refers to Papias only in his third book, and thus seems to date him before the opening of his fourth book in 109. Papias himself knows several New Testament books, whose dates are themselves controversial, and was informed by John the Evangelist, the daughters of Philip and many elders who had themselves heard the Twelve Apostles. He is also called a companion of the long-lived Polycarp 69 For all these reasons, Papias is thought to have written around the turn of the second century. <laughs> Sources Papias describes his way of gathering information in his preface, I shall not hesitate also to put into ordered form for you, along with the interpretations, everything I learned carefully in the past from the elders and noted down carefully, for the truth of which I vouch. For unlike most people I took no pleasure in those who told many different stories, but only in those who taught the truth. Nor did I take pleasure in those who reported their memory of someone else's commandments, but only in those who reported their memory of the commandments given by the Lord to the faith and proceeding from the truth itself. And if by chance anyone who had been in attendance on the elders arrived, I made inquiries about the words of the elders—what Andrew or Peter had said, or Philip or Thomas or James or John or Matthew or any other of the Lord's disciples, and whatever Aristian and John the Elder, the Lord's disciples, were saying. For I did not think that information from the books would profit me as much as information from a living and surviving voice. Papias, then, inquired of travelers passing through Hierapolis what the surviving disciples of Jesus and the elders—those who had personally known the twelve apostles—were saying. One of these disciples was Aristian, probably bishop of nearby Smyrna, and another was John the Elder, usually identified despite Eusebius' protest with John the Evangelist, residing in nearby Ephesus, of whom Papias was a hearer. Papias frequently cited both. From the daughters of Philip, who settled in Hierapolis, Papias learned still other traditions. There is some debate about the intention of Papias' last sentence in the above quotation, for I did not think that information from the books would profit me as much as information from a living and surviving voice. One side of the debate holds, with the long standing opinion of 20th century scholarship, that in Papias' day written statements were held at a lower value than oral statements. The other side observes that, "...living voice," was a topos, an established phrase referring to personal instruction and apprenticeship, and thus Papias indicates his preference for personal instruction over isolated book learning. Fragments <laughs> 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 Despite indications that the work of Papias was still extant in the late Middle Ages, the full text is now lost. Extracts, however, appear in a number of other writings, some of which cite a book number. 
MacDonald proposes the following tentative reconstruction of the five books, following a presumed Matthean order. <laughs> Gospel origins Papias provides the earliest extant account of who wrote the Gospels. Eusebius preserves two possibly verbatim excerpts from Papias on the origins of the Gospels, one concerning Mark and then another concerning Matthew. On Mark, Papias cites John the Elder. The elder used to say, Mark, in his capacity as Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately as many things as he recalled from memory though not in an ordered form of the things either said or done by the Lord. For he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him, but later, as I said, Peter, who used to give his teachings in the form of cryi, but had no intention of providing an ordered arrangement of the logia of the Lord. Consequently Mark did nothing wrong when he wrote down some individual items just as he related them from memory. For he made it his one concern not to omit anything he had heard or to falsify anything. The excerpt regarding Matthew says only, Therefore Matthew put the Logia in an ordered arrangement in the Hebrew language, but each person interpreted them as best he could. How to interpret these quotations from Papias has long been a matter of controversy, as the original context for each is missing and the Greek is in several respects ambiguous and seems to employ technical rhetorical terminology. For one thing, it is not even explicit that the writings by Mark and Matthew are the canonical Gospels bearing those names. The word Logia Logia which also appears in the title of Papias' work—is itself problematic. In non-Christian contexts, the usual meaning was oracles, but since the 19th century it has been interpreted as sayings, which sparked numerous theories about a lost, "'sayings gospel' now called Q, resembling the Gospel of Thomas. But the parallelism implies a meaning of things said or done, which suits the canonical gospels well, the apparent claim that Matthew wrote in Hebrew which in Greek could refer to either Hebrew or Aramaic—is echoed by many other ancient authorities. Modern scholars have proposed numerous explanations for this assertion, in light of the prevalent view that canonical Matthew was composed in Greek and not translated from Semitic. One theory is that Matthew himself produced firstly a Semitic work and secondly a recension of that work in Greek. Another is that others translated Matthew into Greek rather freely. Another is that Papias simply means Hebride dialectoi, as a Hebrew style of Greek. Another is that Papias refers to a distinct work now lost, perhaps a sayings collection like Q or the so-called Gospel according to the Hebrews. Yet another is that Papias was simply mistaken. As for Mark, the difficulty has been in understanding the relationship described between Mark and Peter. Whether Peter recalled from memory or Mark recalled Peter preaching, and whether Mark translated this preaching into Greek or Latin or merely expounded on it, and if the former, publicly or just when composing the Gospel, modern scholars have explored a range of possibilities. Eusebius, after quoting Papias, goes on to say that Papias also cited 1 Peter, where Peter speaks of my son Mark, as corroboration. Within the second century, this relation of Peter to Mark S gospel is alluded to by Justin and expanded on by Clement of Alexandria. We do not know what else Papias said about these or the other gospels. He certainly treated John, but some see Papias as the likely unattributed source of at least two later accounts of the gospel origins. Bachum argues that the Muratorian canon, c. 170, has drawn from Papias. The extant fragment, however, preserves only a few final words on Mark and then speaks about Luke and John. Hill argues that Eusebius' earlier account of the origins of the four Gospels is also drawn from Papias. Eschatological Eusebius concludes from the writings of Papias that he was a Chiliast, understanding the millennium as a literal period in which Christ will reign on earth, and chastises Papias for his literal interpretation of figurative passages, writing that Papias appears to have been of very limited understanding and felt that his misunderstanding misled Irenaeus and others Irenaeus indeed quotes the fourth book of Papias for an otherwise unknown saying of Jesus recounted by John the Evangelist which Eusebius doubtless has in mind the Lord used to teach about those times and say the days will come when vines will grow each having 10000 shoots and on each shoot 10000 branches and on each branch 10000 twigs and on each twig 10000 clusters and in each cluster 10000 grapes and each grape when crushed will yield 25 measures of wine 
And when one of the saints takes hold of a cluster, another cluster will cry out, I am better, take me, bless the Lord through me. Similarly a grain of wheat will produce ten thousand heads, and every head will have ten thousand grains, and every grain ten pounds of fine flour, white and clean. And the other fruits, seeds, and grass will produce in similar proportions, and all the animals feeding on these fruits produced by the soil will in turn become peaceful and harmonious toward one another, and fully subject to humankind. These things are believable to those who believe. And when Judas the traitor did not believe and asked, How, then, will such growth be accomplished by the Lord? The Lord said, Those who live until those times will see. Parallels have often been noted between this account and Jewish texts of the period, such as 2 Baruch. On the other hand, Papias is elsewhere said to have understood mystically the Hexameron six days of creation as referring to Christ and the Church. Pericope <inaudible> adulterae <inaudible> Topic. Eusebius concludes his account of Papias by saying that he relates, "...another account about a woman who was accused of many sins before the Lord, which is found in the Gospel according to the Hebrews." Agapius of Hierapolis 10th century offers a fuller summary of what Papias said here, calling the woman an adulteress. The parallel is clear to the famous Pericope Adulterae John 7 a problematic passage absent or relocated in many ancient Gospel manuscripts. The remarkable fact is that the story is known in some form to such an ancient witness as Papias. What is less clear is to what extent Eusebius and Agapius are reporting the words of Papias versus the form of the Pericope known to them from elsewhere. A wide range of versions have come down to us, in fact. Since the passage in John is virtually unknown to the Greek patristic tradition, Eusebius has cited the only parallel he recognized, from the now lost Gospel according to the Hebrews, which may be the version quoted by Didymus the Blind. The nearest agreement with many sins actually occurs in the Johannine text of Armenian Codex Metenidaron 2374, formerly 229. This codex is also remarkable for ascribing the longer ending of Mark to Ariston the Elder which is often seen as somehow connected with Papias. <laughs> Death of Judas According to a sholium attributed to Apollinaris of Laodicea, Papias also related a tale on the grotesque fate of Judas Iscariot. Judas did not die by hanging but lived on, having been cut down before he choked to death. Indeed, the Acts of the Apostles makes this clear, falling headlong he burst open in the middle and his intestines spilled out. Papias, the disciple of John, recounts this more clearly in the fourth book of the Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord, as follows Judas was a terrible, walking example of ungodliness in this world, his flesh so bloated that he was not able to pass through a place where a wagon passes easily, not even his bloated head by itself. For his eyelids, they say, were so swollen that he could not see the light at all, and his eyes could not be seen, even by a doctor using an optical instrument, so far had they sunk below the outer surface. His genitals appeared more loathsome and larger than anyone else's, and when he relieved himself there passed through it pus and worms from every part of his body, much to his shame. After much agony and punishment, they say, he finally died in his own place, and because of the stench the area is deserted and uninhabitable even now, in fact, to this day one cannot pass that place without holding one's nose, so great was the discharge from his body, and so far did it spread over the ground. <laughs> Death of John Two late sources Philip of Side and George Hamartolus cite the second book of Papias as recording that John and his brother James were killed by the Jews. However, modern scholars doubt the reliability of the two sources regarding Papias. According to the two sources, Papias presented this as fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus on the martyrdom of these two brothers. This is consistent with a tradition attested in several ancient martyrologies. Barsabbas Papias relates, on the authority of the daughters of Philip, an event concerning Justus Barsabbas, who according to Acts was one of two candidates proposed to join the Twelve Apostles. The summary in Eusebius tells us that he "...drank a deadly poison and suffered no harm," while Philip of Side recounts that he 
drank snake venom in the name of Christ when put to the test by unbelievers and was protected from all harm. The account about Justus Barsabbas is followed by a one about the resurrection of the mother of a certain man name. This account may be connected to a verse from the longer ending of Mark. They will pick up snakes in their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. Topic: <inaudible> Reliability. Topic: Eusebius, despite his own views on Papias, knew that Irenaeus believed Papias to be a reliable witness to original apostolic traditions. Various scholars have questioned Papias' reliability. Yunman Park states. Many modern scholars have dismissed the reliability of the tradition from Papias primarily because they believe it was formulated to vindicate the apostolicity of Mark's Gospel." Much discussion of Papias's comments about the Gospel of Mark and Gospel of Matthew is concerned with assessing Papias' reliability as evidence for the origins of these Gospels or with emphasizing the apologetic character of the Gospels in order to discredit their reliability. Casey argued that Papias was indeed reliable, but reliable about a Hebrew collection of sayings by the Apostle Matthew which had nothing to do with the Greek Gospel of Matthew, either incorrectly ascribed to Matthew or written by another Matthias. See also Q+, Papias hypothesis Notes Topic Topic References Topic Topic Bibliography Topic Holmes, Michael W. two thousand six. The Apostolic Fathers in English. ISBN O eight O one O three one O eight seven Dennis R. MacDonald, Two Shipwrecked Gospels. The Logoi of Jesus and Papias's Exposition of Logia about the Lord, Leiden, Brill, 2012. Monty A. Shanks, Papias and the New Testament, Eugene o. R., Pickwick Publications, 2013 with the annotated English translation of the fragments, pp. 105–260. External links Chronicon.net – Complete fragments of Papias with new discoveries listed Biblical Audio 2012 – Papias translation and audio version based on Chronicon.net fragments Christian Classics Ethereal Library – Fragments of Papias Early Christian Writings – Fragments of Papias Patristics in English Project – Fragments of Papias Catholic Encyclopedia – Street Papias including an explanation of why Logia is not to be rendered as sayings, but as oracles. <laughs>